right, folks, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered for Monday, November 26, 2018. Tomorrow is the big day in Mississippi where voters go to the polls to choose between Mike Espy as well as Confederate lover uh, Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith. She's losing more money this time from Major League Baseball. We'll break down exactly the state of the race and talk to the campaign manager for Mike Espy right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Also, a good man with a gun killed by police in an Alabama mall, but guess what? He's black and a veteran. Had a permit for the gun, yet he is still dead. His family is demanding answers. We'll give the latest in that particular case. Also, in Milwaukee, body cam footage just released shows officers shooting a black man with his hands out and kneeling down. The DA said the shooting was justified. What the hell video was he watching? Also, Utah Congresswoman Mia Love, she lost her re-election bid in her, in her concession speech today, blasted Donald Trump, and said the GOP, they have no relationship with minorities. Oh, we didn't know that, Mia. I'll show y'all some of that. Also, this weekend on social media, all kind of folks were upset over a preacher in Mississippi who reached his pulpit by flying to the sanctuary. We got the video, and he will join us right here to explain what he was doing and why he was doing it. Also, Gregory Hines, Marvin Gaye, and Kwanzaa all get new forever stamp from the post office. And two more white folks, a white woman in Maryland and a white dude in Florida lost their job because they dumb as hell. We'll explain it all to you. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin on the filter. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah, yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rolling with rolling now. Yeah. He's funk, he's fresh, he's real, the best you know. He's rolling, Martin. All right, y'all, big, big day tomorrow in Mississippi as voters go to the polls for the runoff between Republican Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith and her challenger, Secretary of Agriculture, the former secretary, Mike Espy. It has been, of course, uh, a long slog since November 6th when the two were the top two vote-getters uh, in Mississippi. They are trying to, of course, uh, fill the vacant seat uh, from Thad Cochran. He retired due to health reasons, and the governor appointed Cindy Hyde-Smith to the position. But, man, she has had a difficult time. Uh, right now, she's at a campaign rally with uh, the orange one in Mississippi. Uh, guys, you can take some of that live if you want to. Uh, and so, uh, again, Trump right now is speaking. Uh, you know, no idea what he's talking about, but who cares? Y'all can come back to me. Uh, but the bottom line is, of course, he's down there lying, uh, as usual. Uh, so what is happening, folks, is this, is this here. If Espy is able to win, he becomes the first African-American since Reconstruction to represent Mississippi in the United States Senate. But you have Cindy Hyde-Smith, of course, in a very conservative state. She's appealing to as many rabid Confederates as possible. And so this is a woman who has made a comment talking about uh, she would more than welcome to be sitting on the front row at a public hanging along with a guy who endorsed her uh, for the position. She also posed with a Confederate hat and a musket saying, quote, Mississippi history at its best. Yeah, not for black people. She also joked about voter suppression at liberal colleges. This is also the same woman who went to a segregation academy as a child and sent her own daughter to the nearly all-white private school. And those schools, of course, were created so white folks would not have to send their kids to public schools with black people. She also sponsored legislation to name a section of the highway after Jefferson Davis, of course, the greatest traitor in American history, the guy who was the president of the Confederacy and somebody who uh, Mississippi just really, 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 really loves. She also pushed a resolution praising Confederate soldiers' effort to, quote, defend his homeland. Really? And she was a Democrat until the first black president came along, and she quickly said, oh, no, I'm now a Republican. And so here's the deal, folks. She also refuses to answer questions about this. Thank you, guys. Senator, can I ask you, why not speak to us about the issue of race? Yeah. It's, it's an issue on voters' minds. Why not speak about the issue of race? Really interested in issues. 
And there's a lot of people that we've talked to across this state that are concerned about your remarks and what you were apologizing for. Senator, why not speak to this issue? Your comments offended a great number of people, Senator. No, you haven't. I'm, I'm wondering, though, what, what, what is it that you were apologizing Senator, for? Senator, how does Mississippi move forward from this to Brookhaven Academy and Senate Republic? Senator, you stood inside of Jefferson Davis's, Davis's house, and you said that this is Mississippi history at its best. Senator, what did you mean by that? Standing inside of Jefferson Davis's house and saying that Mississippi has... Senator, this is Senator, a third of your electorate is, is African-American. But, Senator, you're running to be the U.S. Senator of the United States Senate. So here's the deal, of course. Jenny Hyde-Smith, she's been running from the media uh, for the past several weeks. Weeks. Republicans are so worried. They have sent 100 paid Republican staffers on the ground to help her out. She has not done any media uh, since then. Even last week's debate, she ran out of the debate when it was over. She sent uh, the other U.S. senator from Mississippi to answer media questions because she said her husband was at a prayer event and she really, really needed to go see him. Okay, this is a woman, y'all, who is the current United States senator who refuses to answer any questions. In fact, yesterday at a campaign event, uh, she ran out the back door before the media could catch her. Then, of course, her bu bus broke down on the side of the highway uh, <laughs> while they were going to another campaign event. Talk about crazy. She's also catching lots of flack because uh, corporations uh, who have been donating to her campaign, they have been caught in a major, major uh, kerfuffle. And as a result, they're pulling their money. Here are all the corporations that have pulled their money from her. Walmart, Pfizer, Aetna, Amgen, Boston Scientific, Alitos, AT&T, Union Pacific. Uh, but... Major League Baseball is a new one. Er Ernst & Young also pulled their money. Major League Baseball, their pack gave the money on Saturday. Well, guess what? They caught loads of hell, loads of hell from social media within 12 hours. They said, uh, can we get our money back, please? Now, I don't know what the hell the lobbyist was doing, why he wasn't paying attention over the last week because everybody else was pulling their money as a result of her public hanging comment. Now, Mike Espy, he has been focused on the issues, traveling all across uh, the state, to deal with what's going on. And he, of course, in his closing ad, talks about the business angle as it relates to her comment, how it impacts Mississippi. How embarrassing is Cindy Hyde-Smith? Walmart said Hyde-Smith's recent comments clearly do not reflect the values of our company. Now AT&T, Union Pacific, and other Fortune 500 companies, company after company, has rejected her divisive words. We've worked hard to overcome the stereotypes that hurt our economy and cost us jobs. Her words should not reflect Mississippi's values either. Cindy Hyde-Smith, so embarrassing, she'd be a disaster for Mississippi. I'm Mike Espy, and I approve this message. All right, folks. Now, Megan uh, Malone, one of the founders of Republican Women for Progress, Never Trumpers, who recruit female GOP candidates. Whoa, this is what she said about Cindy Hyde-Smith. Words matter, and Hyde-Smith show she's unfit to represent Mississippi in the Senate. I'm not saying you have to vote for Mike Espy, but I am saying that if you love our state and want to see it represented as best as it can, you should not vote for Cindy Hyde-Smith. Wow. Uh, that's quite, quite interesting. Uh, guys, do me a favor. This morning, of course, uh, I talk, caught up with Mike Espy on the Tom Jordan Morning Show. Let's see if we can take some of that right now. To vote absent, vote absentee by Saturday. But, of course, the election is tomorrow all across Mississippi. Our guest is Secretary Mike Espy. He joins us right now. Course, Doc, how you doing? Hey, Roland. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good, doing good. Uh, first of all, before we get to, of course, you crisscross in the state, uh, more bad news for your opponent, uh, whatchamacallit, Cindy Hyde-Smith. Uh, more more companies, more companies uh, are pulling money from her. Uh, the latest Major League Baseball, their political action committee, uh, donated $5,000 to her campaign. But once that word went out across social media, uh, folks um, were blowing them up. And then they rescinded that yesterday saying, uh, please send our money back. Uh, and you also had uh, several other companies uh, that also did not agree with her public hanging comment. Uh, right. And and she has been running away from everybody, will not talk to any media, went, ran out the back door of an event yesterday. Then her bus broke down as she uh, was traveling across. Um, it's like you, you, you got her scared. You got Sydney Hyde Smith shook. On the run. And man, they, they, have, they have sent 100 paid Republican staffers from Washington to come down here to salvage that campaign. Uh, we were yesterday in the same city. 
I had a rally. I had a press conference after my rally. Her rally was closed, and she left after the rally. But you couldn't have two more, two different scenarios. Wow. And so, I mean, look, look. obviously, uh, Republicans are very scared. They have not put this much energy into it. All right, again, I want to give you some of that. Right now, joining us is Alita Fitzgerald. She's the campaign manager for Mike Espy. Alita, how you doing? Doing fine, Roland. Thanks. Uh, of course. Uh, it's been a big weekend. You've had a lot of people, of course, who were voting absentee. I was seeing the photos and the videos, and there were long lines all over the place. Uh, and uh, some even said that records were broken, uh, your assessment of this weekend. And explain to people who don't know about Mississippi politics exactly who could vote absentee, because everybody couldn't, correct? No, everybody couldn't. Uh, absentee voting is probably the closest thing we have to early voting in other states. People who vote absentee are many times the aged, disabled, uh, people who have to work on election day, students who are, move, are leaving school and going home for the holidays. Uh, so it's a, a general rule that if you're not available to go to the poll and vote on Tuesday, you can vote absentee, but you have to have a reason for doing so. And again, there were uh, a number of people who were voting on Tuesday. Uh, the campaign was really focused on uh, canvassing all across the state. Yes, you're right. Uh, Roland, this campaign is on fire. Uh, we have, people have just embraced the campaign. They're actually carrying the campaign. Uh, we had mass canvases showing up in record numbers. Uh, materials that we were planning to distribute over the weekend got used up in two days. Uh, we've got all kinds of um, uh, things working on our behalf. We have an analytical uh, field team. We have a political field team. We have uh, phone banking and texting, uh, and we have people on the street who are just fired up. As I said to you, I think earlier, my guess has become the vessel for what people are feeling in this state in this time for us in Mississippi and us across the country to say, you know, when enough is enough. Uh, and obviously, okay. when you look at the critical issues, health care is one of those issues. When you talk about uh, the issue of pre existing conditions and, of course, student loan debt, uh, those are things that really jump out that he has been focused on while she has been having to deal with the issue uh, of race that have been tumbling out of her mouth. Well, you know, uh, Maya Angelou says that when people tell you who they are, you should believe them. Uh, and what you see is not... Uh, someone who would put the interest of Mississippians first, regardless of race, regardless of creed, regardless of sexual orientation, uh, whether you're healthy or not, whether you're working low income for low income wages or not. Uh, we have farmers that are starting to speak out now because of the concern they have over their own incomes and tariffs and, and, and world trade uh, issues. So we have young people who we're looking at every day and wondering if this is a state that they would want to raise their families in and if there are opportunities here for them. So Mike has been steadfast in running a campaign to represent all Mississippians and to take care of folks who need help and folks who are sick and folks who are the least of these. So. That message is resonating. Uh, you know, we know that uh, Mississippi is Mississippi, but we have faith that many young people and, and others uh, don't like what they hear from the other side, don't like what they hear from the administration, and we're ready to move on. This is 2018. We, it's, some of the stuff that's happening down here is like people are stuck in a time bubble. But we are working hard. We are buoyed by what, what's going on out in our communities. And we'll keep our head down through tomorrow evening and be victorious. Uh, Alita, when I talked to um, Mike this morning on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, uh, he said, look, he has to get a mammoth turnout of African-Americans 
uh, in order to win this. Uh, and so when you look at the numbers, uh, again, when you look at the number of black people in that state who are registered, but also the number of, of, of poor folks, the number of people who, who are white, uh, who are being hurt by economic policies on the Republicans. Uh, you know, I made the point on MSNBC, uh, Democrats should be going and talking to those broke white folks uh, and saying, look, you know, uh, you know, what are you what do you guys keep voting for? What have you gotten from the Republican Party? You know, they always try to tell black folks uh, what, what black folks have not gotten from Democrats. Uh, and I've challenged these white Democrats. They should be the ones going to talk to fellow white folks in Mississippi and not being afraid to talk to them, to confront them and to speak to them. Mm. A lot of times people are, are fearful of the other of any kind and and the more we can we can you know make immigration a booger bear and the, the more we can talk we talk about uh folks who are in the majority becoming the minority um that kind of messaging trumps uh even folks best interest uh and standing up for their own best interest but mike has run a campaign where he has tried to uh speak clearly about those issues uh, speak to opportunities for everybody, uh, make sure that everybody has access to health care, regardless of who they are. Uh, and we have steered clear of the divisiveness uh, because there's, there's nothing to be gained in that. So I think you're absolutely right. The more we stay on message, the more we talk to people about the things that affect them and help them to understand that we're not your problem. Your problem is sitting in this administration. So as, more, as much as we can keep that message going forward, it is our hope that eventually people will, uh, will come out and vote and stand up for their own best interests. It's 50th in so many things. And we won't move from that until all of us come together to fight for what's right. All right, Alita, now also, a polls open what time tomorrow? Uh, and what time do they close? Polls open at 7 a.m. and they close at 7 p.m. Uh, but if it's like what happened on November the 6th, they probably won't close for a long time after that. Because if you're in line at 7 p.m., you can vote. No, and no one should be turned away from the poll if they are in line at 7 p.m. So you stay there. Stay there until you're able to vote. All right, then. Uh, and I, we've been making this point. We've been pushing this up on social media all weekend. Uh, if you got family members, if you got friends, church members, fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, people who live in Mississippi, call them, text them, uh, and tell them you want to see them posting images where saying, I have voted. Uh, folks cannot be sitting on the sidelines because, again, uh, I had a video, and I'm trying to get it in a second, uh, where Reverend Barber was there last week, and he talked about in the last midterm election, uh, Thad Cochran won by just 125,000 votes. 1.6 million Mississippians didn't even bother to vote in the last midterm race for U.S. Senate. Uh, and so the reality is this is a winnable race by Mike, Mike Espy, but black folks definitely got to get out there and vote. He has no shot if they don't. This is the most critical time in our history, Roland, in our recent history. People have got to come out. They've got to come out. We have to stand up, uh, not only for Mississippians, but for folks all across this country. It is time to stop this madness and get ourselves uh, recalibrated to what government is all about and have representation that is meaningful. And, uh, you know, there would be absolutely no question about this race, but that if Mike Espy were white, were white. there would be no question about this race about who would be the better candidate. So we have to stand up for ourselves and stand up for what is right. So we encourage everybody across this country to support this campaign in any way possible. And you're absolutely right. Call your family. Most everybody comes out of Mississippi, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, whenever you meet people and they say, uh, oh, I'm from Chicago, I'm like, no, no, where your people from? Yeah. Where your people <laughs> That's from? Right. And then, Somewhere you're going to find your roots back here. That, that <laughs> is it. Alita Fitzgerald, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. All right. Thank you very much. Also, people, we talked about uh, the closing ad. This is what Mike Espy dropped yesterday uh, as well. Guys, go to my iPad, please. Chance, I brought people together. Ronald Reagan signed the first bill I wrote 
on infrastructure and jobs. I rose above party and supported a Republican governor because after Katrina, it was the right thing to do. Today, the crisis is the division in Washington. So I'm asking you for another chance. Give me two years, and I'll work to find common ground and bring us together again. I'm Mike Espy, and I approve this message. All right, folks, want to bring my panel right now. Michael Brown, former vice chair, DNC Finance Committee, Long Victoria Burt, writer, National News, News, Newspaper Republicans Association, Eugene Craig III, CEO, Eugene Craig Organization. Michael, I want to go with you. Uh, and I, I made that point on MSNBC, when, and, I, and, I, and I said it. Democrats have got to stop being scared of white folks in the South. There's this whole idea, well, look, you know what, we look, we just, we just can't compete in Mississippi, can't compete in Alabama. It's just too red. Uh, and again, I think uh, the likes of Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, they got to go to white folks and look them in the eye and say, y'all broke. You're sick as hell and you, you got no jobs. Your education is bad. Uh, and so uh, take one of Trump's lines. What the hell you got to lose? Absolutely. Frankly, <clears throat> and, and kudos to Miss Fitzgerald. She clearly is doing a wonderful job down there and good luck to her. Um, but also take a, a page out of Barack Obama's book. Clearly, it wasn't just black folks that got him elected. Uh, he had to go up into Appalachia. He had to go into the southwestern United States. He had to go down south. Um, and we we're looking at some of the numbers earlier, Roland. Yes, we're going to need unbelievable turnout um, with African Americans. It needs about 22 percent, clearly north of 22 percent of the white vote would be outstanding, but he has to get a probably a minimum of 22 percent yeah, he said, of the white vote. Mike Espy this morning, Lauren, said about 25 percent of the white vote. He said and he's going to have to get, again, it's going to have to be, look, 88, 90 percent of the black vote as well. <coughs> uh, before, I, before I go to you, Lauren, I want to play this here. So Reverend Barber was, Reverend William Barber was, of course, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi last week, uh, and I was doing some editing this weekend because he had a news conference, uh, and, and I, people should hear these numbers to understand, you know, again, the potential for being able to reach out to folks. Uh, we, of course, we went to Alabama, we went to Mississippi last week with the folks with B Woke Vote, and so this is what we put together. In Mississippi, 52% of all Mississippians are poor. That's right. 1.5 million people. Mm. Poverty is a moral issue in this state. 59% of all children in Mississippi are poor. Mm. That's 437,000 children. 53% of all women in Mississippi are poor. That's 816,000 people. 67% of people of color are poor. That's 843,000 people. 43% of white people are poor. That's 668,000 people. The poor in this state hold the power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And the poor are going to have to speak up. is not a new phenomena. Uh, RFK did, you know, Robert F. Kennedy did it, LBJ did it. The Democratic Party is well versed in talking to poor white people. Well, they why they to. haven't, why they they haven't done it again, I'm not sure, but it's become <laughs> an issue, unfortunately, because of the way our politics work, work with regard to money. Uh, poor people do not have the type of lobbying and do not have the type of political power that the moneyed interests do, and that's part of the reason why we're in this sort of era of, obviously, money politics after Citizens uh, United. Uh, and poor people don't have the lobbying, quite frankly. But if they were to show the, the voting power, that all can change because you either have money or you have votes uh, when it comes to power and politics. The, the unfortunate fact, though, is that, you know, Sydney Hyde, uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith is the type of sort of dumb Republican candidate in the same vein of a, a Ron DeSantis. And uh, it, you figure if Ron DeSantis can sneak in there against a candidate that was clearly better than he was and smarter than he was, it's quite likely that it could happen again in this case. Of course, Alabama shows us it can happen in Mississippi. But it, it is going to take, it's, it's a very strangely timed election, as we right. know, right after Thanksgiving. So it is going to take some, some, you know, historic numbers. But Eugene, when you look at the numbers, 944,000 people voted uh, on November 6th uh, uh, for Cindy Hyde-Smith, for Mike Espy, as well as for McDaniel, the Tea Party candidate, okay? And so we know there's a massive drop-off uh, when it comes to a runoff. As I said, the turnout in the 2014 midterm election was 29%. In 2016, it was 55%. And so if the Espy campaign, they believe that if they can get 
450,000 votes, upwards of 500,000, they can actually beat her. And this is also a woman who it's not like Republicans are really like running behind her. You know, Donald Trump is there right now. He, of course, got everybody all focused and excited. Uh, he's, in fact, he's doing two rallies for her. He's doing one right now, then one at, um, at 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Republicans are scared to death that SP could very well beat Cindy Hyde-Smith. Yeah, re Republicans are terrified. Uh, the RNC has 100 people on the ground right now. They're absolutely ignoring the race in Georgia, which would be the equivalent of a, of a uh, extra point field goal kick uh, for them to win in the runoff over there. Um, you know, Trump's doing two rallies in one day. That's presidential level, you know, stuff. Uh, that shows the paranoia that folk have of this being another uh, Alabama. But I would like to focus on a whole, uh, another number. Uh, there was a poll that was released uh, this weekend uh, that shows Cindy Highsmith up. But if you look at the actual numbers there and the way they, the makeup of the electorate that they use, if, for, if black voters make up 40 percent of the voting population, Mike Espy wins, as long as he carries about 15, 18 percent of the white vote. Well, again, well, he thinks he's going to need 25 percent because they're expecting Mike, uh, obviously, a bump for her. But again, yeah. to, to Lawrence's point, Mike, and this is what everything you said about Andrew Gillum is correct. But here's the deal. Black folks can't sit at home. <laughs> the reason Andrew Gillum is not the governor today is because Miami Dade, where he was banking on massive turnout, came in at about 54 percent, where you had these largely white counties, where 65, 68, 70. And so if, 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 if the Miami data had turned out at 65 or 70 percent, Andrew Gillum is, is the governor running away. And so what we've seen is that, of course, huge numbers of African Americans, uh, he, the, the white vote he's going to get is, is, is who he's going to get. But it's also interesting, when you look at these columnists, these white columnists who've been writing about Sidney Hyde Smith, talking about white privilege. The Jackson Free Press dropped this story about the segregated schools uh, just this weekend. Look, they could have written that story in the last six months. And so all of a sudden, there's been this renewed attention on her where even white media in Mississippi are dropping stories that I'm even I'm going, whoa, where in the hell have they been? Well, and I've talked to some of um um, the secretary's folks in Mississippi, and they think they really, frankly, should have won this in early November, um, they, if, if folks had turned out. And now they're bank hoping that folks can get up and get, vote again, because with our community, don't let there be a raindrop or too hot, or the babysitter didn't show up, or I have a, I have some food on well, the stove. That's, that's white folks that, too. That, that, that's voters across the country. But I can't worry. When about, it, as you know, that's my point. Worry about white folks. That's my right, point. Exactly. That, that's, that's voters across the country. Correct. But what you have here is if you vote your numbers, and that was the reason why I played that bite, Lauren, from, from Reverend Barber. Yeah. If you vote your numbers, the reality is here. If, if black turnout is, it goes here and white turnout stands here, that compensates right. for the gap between there being yep. more whites than blacks. Lauren, then, uh, Eugene, I'm going to my next question. Yeah, the, the thing of, of it is, though, is you do have the voter suppression issue sort of lurking out there in so many of these states, particularly in the South. Um, the Broward ballot design issue that popped up for Andrew Gillum was, you know, not particularly helpful for Democrats. That also was a ballot that was approved yeah, by the party. Yeah, I know, you're right. And I think that that's this sort of weird, you know, electoral games that happen in the South are problematic. You know, the fact, the reason you're seeing white columnists and others criticize this candidate is this is one of the worst candidates we've seen <laughs> in a long time. And, of course, what happened on Election Day uh, is a very obvious sign that the time, gotcha. tide is Tide is turning against Donald Trump, and when they field a, a really bad, dumb candidate like this, it is a sort of moment. I mean, this is kind of a new. She's actually a new low. A person that can't answer I mean, basic she's dumb questions. As hell. Yeah, I mean, you're, she's you're, dumb <laughs> as hell. And then that whole thing of not wanting to talk to the media, and I'm running down the street. You're running for public office, okay? This is not a private company. Right. You're going to be questioned. And, People and, are going to ask you questions. And in fact, so it's, and in it's fact Eugene, during the debate last week, uh, her people said, no, you have got, we will not agree to a debate unless you allow us right. an hour before to have our own notepad. Right. She walked in damn near with, with... binders. No, not binders. She had Ron Chernow's book on Hamilton. <laughs> I mean, that's how huge her notes were. Right. She read her apology. Right. She literally couldn't say her name without reading it. Right.
Right. This is yeah. not the brightest bulb in a dark room. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, they wanted a no studio audience right. and, uh, you know, all these rules, including with the, yep. the notes and whatnot. I mean, she, she's dumb as hell. I mean, she's dumb as a bag of bricks. Yeah, I hate to say it, but it's the truth. Um, yeah, that's the truth. And, and and what you're seeing right now is the RNC and the GOP uh, coalesce and circle the wagon to deploy every single resource away from an actual winnable race to this Got race. It. Um, you know, to help her out. All right, then. Also, folks, uh, there are people who, of course, been traveling all through Mississippi, helping out. Erica Alexander, I uh, got a text that she's on, on the ground there as well. It's going to be a con there's a concert actually happening right now uh, for the next two hours for Mike Espy, a GOTV uh, effort as well. And then also, Ayanna Presley, of course, uh, the African-American woman uh, from Massachusetts, uh, she landed yesterday and was campaigning for Mike Espy, and she dropped this video right here. Hi, everyone. My name's Ayanna Presley. I'm the representative-elect for the Massachusetts 7, and I'm in Mississippi. I came all the way from Boston to campaign for my friend, Mike Espy. Washington is in gridlock. Our country is at a crossroads. This election is a fight for the soul of our nation, the preservation of our democracy, and victory is within our reach. But you've got to show up on Tuesday. November 27th. Mike Espy's name might be on the ballot, but you know what else is on the ballot? Access to good jobs, access to quality and affordable health care, access to excellent schools. These issues should not be partisan issues. Mississippi, you deserve Mike Espy. Mississippi, you need Mike Espy. So on Tuesday, November 27th, the vote. Don't pay attention to the polls. My race had me down by 13 points and we won by 17. So a famous person once said, don't boo vote. I'm saying that too, but I'm also saying don't worry, work, and all the way to the polls on Tuesday, November 27th. All right, folks. And so, again, uh, if you know somebody, tell them get off their butts and go out and vote. Let's talk about what happened in Alabama, folks. The Thanksgiving Day shooting was stunning. River Chase Galleria uh, Mall in Hoover, Alabama. This brother, Emantic E.J. Bradford Jr., okay, initially what the cops said was that he was the gunman who shot a teenager in the 12-year-old. Uh, the 12-year-old. Well, then the problem was cops came back and said um, it wasn't him. Of course, Bradford is an Army veteran who was home for Thanksgiving. His father is a Birmingham police officer. The family hired attorney Ben Crump, and they say several witnesses have come forward to say the police officer who killed Bradford didn't give any verbal commands before shooting him in the face. Crump says they offered Bradford no medical assistance after the shooting. 200 protesters walked through the mall on Saturday. The family is asking for the release of all mall security and body cam video uh, in about 30 minutes. There's going to be another protest. And joining us right now is Tez Files, a Black Lives Matter activist in Birmingham. Uh, uh, Tez, how are you doing? Hey, how are you rolling? Uh, we've been, of course, uh, following this story. I mean, it, it is stunning. Uh, and we've heard the police have said that his gun was, Bradford's gun was drawn. And he was running away. Uh, all of that. Do we even know if the officers had body cam? Uh, the officers have not stated what, uh, whether their body cams were on at the time, but they have said that they've turned over all footage and all uh, evidence to the Alabama law enforcement agency, Aaliyah. Uh, and so, uh, and again, and so again, a, bu a busy mall, and they said that he was initially the shooter, which means that he's not, which means that the actual shooter is still it's at still large. on the loose. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of code red by cops? Are they even worried? Are they scouring the city to find a person who shot who shot two people in a mall? Uh, it doesn't seem like it on our end, Roland. It seems as if this is being uh, swept under the rug. Uh, it seems uh, they released uh, an apology uh, earlier today that uh, still blamed e um, EJ for his own death um, and then came back an hour later and try to apologize for the apology. And so it seems on our end that uh, there is no um, remorse for what they did to this young man. It seems on our end as if there, uh, there is uh, them trying to evade um, responsibility. And so that's what we feel on the ground. Uh, E.J. Bradford, uh, he was serving in the Army. He was a veteran. Uh, his dad is a Birmingham police officer. Surely his dad uh, has, to be, has to be stunned being a police officer himself. 
Absolutely. Uh, they, the family had a press conference yesterday uh, with their lawyer, as you, as you uh, mentioned, Mr. Crump. And his father, talk, his father, who's a veteran officer, uh, was a police officer for at least 20 years, I believe. His father said, you know, he doesn't feel like they follow protocol. He, he doesn't feel like uh, justice will serve. And he's upset. Um, he's pissed. And rightfully so. The entire family is hurting. Our community is hurting. Um, and, and we're just trying to make sense of a situation. And uh, I mean, because before they even had full ev information, they released a story that made it look like the police were cowboys who came in and saved the day and killed a, a shooter. And then once they realized, like, oh, a shooter is still on the loose, we have to tell the public the truth. And this really came as a result of a lot of regular black folks with their Instagrams and their Facebook lives who had evidence themselves. And they said, right after the police said that they had shot the shooter, uh, people on, on, on Facebook and on Instagram were saying that they lied. They told us the minute they said that narrative, people on the ground said that they lied. And so the truth came as a result of regular folks on the ground doing their own investigation and not allowing the police to control the narrative. Uh, Tez, you guys are going to be having a protest starting at 7 p.m. Eastern. Where is it taking place? Uh, it's going to be at the uh, uh, Hoover Police Station. Hoover PD is the police department that uh, shot and killed EJ. Uh, and so we're, the protest is in a little bit, and that's where I'm headed to now, uh, Roland. And it's uh, at the Hoover Police Station, 100 Municipal Lane uh, in Hoover, Alabama. All right, then. Well, Tess, we certainly appreciate you joining us. and certainly keep us up to date on what's happening there in uh, the Birmingham area. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Roland. Folks, stunning story out of Minnesota, uh, where uh, Jerry Smith Jr. was shot by cops in August. Uh, Chief Deputy and District Attorney Kent Laverne concluded in June if the officers were, were justified in using deadly force. They believe Smith was armed or was reaching for a gun behind an air conditioning unit on the roof. Of course, no gun was ever found. Now, Smith, who had no criminal record, was not charged with any crime. He now has lost the use of his one of his legs. Now, here's the issue. Body cam footage has now been released. Now, remember, one officer says that he doesn't have a gun. The victim, Jerry Smith Jr., shows his hands, but the cops shoot anyway. Watch this video. He doesn't have a gun in his hand, but he was hiding behind an AK. Now, guys, I want you to I want you to roll that back. Uh, I want you to roll that back, and I want you to freeze it right before they fire. The police officers, folks, said, and the, the, okay, the DA, he was reaching for a gun behind the air conditioning unit. Do you see how far the air conditioning unit is from where he's standing? Press play. At no point do you see him reaching behind the air conditioning unit. Smith's family is suing the city of Milwaukee. Lauren, again, what, what, this is what, what the hell, the DA, this is why black folks have been focused and other, and white progressives have been focused on throwing out these DAs. Right. So the DA in St. Louis, Bob McCullough thrown out. You see the new DA in Philadelphia, new DA in Chicago, mm -hmm. new DA in Dallas, new DA, uh, you know, all across the country. Because you have these these DAs who are in the pockets of police departments. I don't understand. There's no way in hell you can watch that video right. and believe the cops. Yeah, he was reaching for a gun. He wasn't even near the air conditioning unit. Yeah. And just like so many other videos we've seen, Philando Castile, Eric Gardner, it's like even when you have the video, it makes you wonder what was going on before we had all this technology that allowed us to see these things because of the technology that we have. This is body well, camera. They, they used to throw guns and knives down. I mean, Joe Supercoat said that. <laughs> right, exactly. And so body camera footage, you know, now we have the cops video. And we still, you still can't get a prosecution out of any of this. So, you know, it is obvious that uh, police are effectively, from a legal standpoint, a protected class in our society. They're more of a pr protected class in our military, which is a very interesting thing, because if you mess up in the military, you're prosecuted for it, you right. know. And um, we give police so much latitude that it, is, uh, it has become outsized in so many jurisdictions and uh, 
their union is, of course, very extremely powerful, to say the least. So we have these situations where even when you see a video that refutes what was said, uh, we did, of course, have the recent Chicago case, which I thought was very surprising to me that that, that cop was actually prosecuted. I mean, prosecuted, that was... <laughs> convicted, yeah, not a first-degree murder, that was second-degree murder. Right. But the fact that he was prosecuted in that particular jurisdiction, Chicago, which has a particular history... Uh, that is known very well. Right. You know, uh, I, I thought that was fairly shocking. But this is this is actually a pretty shocking example, even even in the lexicon of examples we've had. Again, Mike, this is a why people are focused on electing DAs who have who, with conscience, because for this assistant DA to somehow say that shooting was justified, I, there, I, I don't see how. I mean, I thought he was actually standing right next to the air conditioning unit. <laughs> Hell, that was <clears throat> significant distance between him and the unit. And thoughts and prayers to the to the families. And I, I was like, I was waiting for the video. I thought he was going to get close to the air conditioning unit. I was waiting for that to happen. <laughs> right. And when it, but but they know they can say whatever they need to say in their report. And if they know they have a cooperative DA, they can say whatever they're going to say, and they're going to be covered. And that's the bottom line. And that's it's unfortunate that it continues to happen, and it's going to continue to happen. On the magic. Eugene, it's crazy. You know, cops are still lying about you know what. what on video, um, you know, but the issue is that you got to have a DA as well in the pursuit of charges that are necessary. And uh, we have a situation like this. I, I'm now proponent of the recall elections. Uh, this DA, you know, needs to be recalled and uh, need a new DA installed. All right, folks, going to a break right now. We come back. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a couple of white folks. One white guy in Florida, one white woman in Maryland. Don't have a job today because you know what? They stupid as hell on social media. Uh, and of course, we'll also talk about uh, hashtag the flying preacher. Uh, of course, uh, y have y'all seen this video right here? This is the video of the preacher uh, in Mississippi, of course, uh, who used a harness uh, to, in essence, fly to his pulpit. All oh, these people lost their mind on social media. They were trashing him, trashing the church. In fact, they were trashing all black churches in America uh, as a result uh, of Pastor Orr. Uh, doing this. We got the video. If y'all can play it, please. Uh, and so we're going to be talking. So this is the video. We're going to be talking to this pastor in just a moment right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered to explain why he did it and also his thoughts on the reaction from people. It's got millions of views. Uh, so all of that next. Roland Martin Unfiltered. Back in a moment. Roller Martin Unfiltered, be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. All right, folks. Uh, today, Utah Congresswoman Mia Love, she conceded her congressional race. It had been in doubt as they kept counting the ballots. Uh, and in her 11-minute uh, statement, ooh, she had a couple of things to say about the orange one, as well as the Republican Party and minority, minority voters. Press play. I am proud of the fact that I nagged the president every day to bring Joshua Holt home. <laughs> he is... An American and all Americans should know that their country and their representatives will not forget or abandon them. Now, when the president, when President Trump took a jab at me because he said, because he thought that the race was over and he lamented that I wouldn't ask him to come to the state of Utah, I was somewhat surprised at first. Um, but with every decision I make, I have to ask myself again, at what cost? The president's behavior towards me made me wonder, what did he have to gain by saying such a thing about a fellow, a fellow Republican? It was not really about asking him to do more, was it? Or was it something else? Well, Mr. President, we'll have to chat about that. However, this gave me a clear vision of his world as it is. No real relationships, just convenient transactions. That is an insufficient way to implement sincere service and policy. This election experience and these comments shines a spotlight on the problems Washington politicians have with minorities and black Americans. It's transactional. It's not personal. You see, we feel like politicians claim they know what's best for us from a safe distance. Yet they're never willing to take us home. 
Because Republicans never take minorities, minority communities into their home and citizens into their homes and into their hearts, they stay with Democrats and bureaucrats in Washington because they do take them home, or at least make them feel like they have a home. I've seen the cost to conservatives for not truly taking people into their hearts. Democrats saw newly elected black members and women to Congress in this election. This is a matter of fact that Republicans lost in this regard. However, minority communities need to ask themselves a question also. At what cost? What is the cost of staying with the Democrat Party that perpetually delivers exactly what you need to stay exactly where you are? To make poverty tolerable instead of temporary. People who judge their success by how many people they can put into poverty programs versus how many people they can get out of them. I am a Republican. I know conservative policies work. They lift everyone. They lift the poor, the young, the vulnerable, the black and the white. Our conservative policies save our young and unborn children. When the pundits tell us that we're out of luck, the deck is stacked against us. We say no, no way, not in this country. Because under conservative policies, the deck is not stacked against us and we all have a chance. Conservative policies make it so that no one in this country is predestined to be poor. I know because I've lived them. I've put them into action. I promoted them throughout our state and across the country. The problem is not the policy. It is that we are never taken into hearts and into homes. All right, Eugene Craig, I want to go to you. You're a Republican on our panel today. Uh, did Mia Love just realize because she lost the Republicans have not been reaching out to black and other uh, people of color? Not a complete bullshit. She just spent the last four years not reaching out to people of color herself and has spent many times just running from people of color. Um, you know, she ran from being branded as a quote-unquote black Republican. Um, so as I said earlier day on Twitter, I said this is a very rich time for me to redefine and you know, rediscover her blackness. Um, and then to you know, discover that this president, you know, may just not like black people. Um, you know, but it's it's an interesting hot take. I mean, I think it's, you know, for her to to go and and, and come out swinging the way she did, as you know, you know, to tend to be the, the trend when people uh, lose re-election and now, quote unquote, free to say what they really think. I mean, it, it's crazy. I think it's it's baffling. I mean, you know, if I if I'm sitting if me was on the show and I said, hey, what, what was the last black Republican candidate you supported? What was the last time you stepped into a black community um, and and reached your hand out and actually listened to what black communities wanted? Um, you know, I mean, you cannot come in and take a swipe at the party for doing the same exact thing that you did, and then take a swipe at black people for not wanting to engage the party. That's bullshit. And she so, doesn't represent black people, so for her, that is a very complicated question. She represents, you know, a, a, a district in Utah. Right. But even a, a more... A district in Utah, she's a woman uh, of Haitian descent. Mm -hmm. uh, but, again, he... to stand up there <laughs> and, 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 you and, know, to, and to blast the party, right. you're blasting Trump. And, but then, and then, I was, but... I, then I was confused because I was confused <laughs> because on one hand she says Republicans... It's been transactional, it's not relational. But then she said, well, black people have got to ask themselves, you know, why they were Democrats. Well, you just answered the question. See, I, I don't understand why this is so hard for black Republicans. Well, to quote, if you ignore black people, right. it's obvious I'm only going to get attention from the person who's not ignoring me. Yeah, but the problem with this is that the reason that she's special within the Republican Party is because she's a rarity. She's a black Republican. She knows that that's what made her special. Her and Tim Scott know that that's what makes them special and gets them attention and gets them somehow positioned at every press conference right over the shoulder of the speaker. They know that. What's so weird about this, I'm sure Eugene knows this as well, is that she just spent the last two years avoiding criticizing Donald Trump. She didn't show up at the convention yep. in Cleveland because she didn't want to get out there and actually speak her mind, so she said absolutely nothing, and Tim Scott did the same thing. They steadfastly avoid <laughs> any conversation about race and Donald Trump because they know what this is and they don't want to actually have to speak it out loud. And now all of a sudden she finds herself 
Oh, the minute oh, she loses, oh, no, wait, 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 I gotta read this. I gotta read this. I gotta read this, Mike. Quote, I, I tweeted this, y'all can pull it up. Quote, now I'm unleashed, <laughs> untethered, and unshackled, and I can say exactly what is on my mind. But she could have done that in office. I, I'm trying to figure well, out. No. She could have done that I mean, I think she and, even uh, had more authority to do it while right. in office. Well, hold on, right. Eugene, wait, wait. That's right. She was asked at the news conference, while Michael responded to Eugene, she was asked at the news conference about that. She said, well, <laughs> you know, when you're an elected official, you kind of got to be, you got to be no, careful you don't. No. what you say. No, you don't. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, what the heck? Michael, go ahead. I, I closed my eyes for a second. I was like, is that Jeff Flake? Is that Bob Corker? Because that's what they do. They have no courage when it's time to have courage, and then all of a sudden they have it. She actually probably could have gotten herself in a much stronger leadership position in the GOP if she spoke her mind, but she chose not to do that until today. Well, if, if actually... I, if, 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 I want to go ahead and, go ahead and uh, uh, see where I pull this up here, if I can, um, uh, they're, because they're... It, this, this is what bothered me as, as I listened to that. As I listened to that, it really, it really bugged me. It really bugged me. Okay, and so let me, let me go. Hold she on. She would have been I, in big I, trouble I, had she spoke her mind like that. Well, but no, it but no, she, she, she didn't. But she's going. But, she, but, but, but here's the deal. Just because you represent Utah still doesn't mean that you could not have said, right. "Hey, Republican Party, talk to black people." Of course, right. I, 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 I want, I want Eugene to respond to this, and then I'm going to go to Lauren. So go to my iPad, please. Here we go to my iPad. All right. This is what I tweeted. My team has been trying for four years to get Representative Mia Love to do a sit-down interview. She gave me her cell at last year's CBC swearing-in, but never returned calls or texts. I would love to still do a one-on-one -on -one to discuss these and other issues of Roller Martin Unfiltered. Eugene, four years she's been there. We tried to get her on News One Now. No response. Never did. Will Hurd, Republican from Texas, came yep. on. Now, maybe that's also because the Texas a and Aggie, and so am I. But he came <laughs> on. Congressman Bill Flores from Texas came on. Maybe that's because he's a Texas a and graduate. I don't know. <laughs> I, I am as well. But I had the, 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 uh, the, 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 the Republican from Kansas who was real conservative. I can't remember his name. Oh, I know you talking He about came that. on the show. Yeah. The white guy from uh, yeah. from North Carolina who coached here at the HBCU caucus. Uh, Paul Walker. Uh, he, he came on the Paul, show. Yeah. And I'm, but, but it's like the only black Republican woman. Four years. That's right. Senator Tim Scott. We did a whole hour special. Senator Lindsey Graham came on the show. But me and oh, for four years, Eugene, never came on the only show that reach black people, but now all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm Angela Davis. <laughs> you can't go ahead. Listen, Roland, me, me and you probably both saw Mia the last time together. That was at the Trailblazer dinner, I believe, in maybe 2013, 2014, right after she was, maybe 15, right after she was elected. She's literally spent her time as a member of Congress running from being black, running from being the black Republican, um, or and just being you know, the black Republican, all the white Republicans like like. Um, you know, I like to contrast her and Will Hurd all the time. You know, Will Hurd, you know, when the president was, you know, started rolling out this whole border wall mess, you know, was everywhere saying, listen, I'm a former CIA agent. You know, I have the literally the largest part of the border in my district. The wall is not going to help. I mean, he's time after time after time stood up, spoke out, used his and voice. In fact, in fact he tried to actually broker a DACA deal. Yeah. Uh, and, and went after Trump on intelligence issues, being a former CIA agent. But, see, but, 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 but can I take it a step further? Will Hurd has been there for black Republicans when we needed him. I can't tell you a single black Republican <laughs> Mia has supported. Yeah, Long, the, the problem is, is that at the end of the day, if she does the interview with you, she has to answer the question of her standing as a black Republican, and for that matter, a black person, period, in the age of Donald Trump. That question has got to be confronted. And right? she also has to and confront she can't, she when can't Donald deal with Trump that. call you the country you're from. Right, but see... The country right. your right. parents right. are right. from. Well, she did a come out... A shithole country. She did no, come no, no, out... No, no, and, and, no. No, and, no, she came and out with her statement. That, all right, but... But she came out with her statement. Right. But it was a statement. But see, the problem, the problem, the bigger problem, of course, is that when you are in this position as a black Republican 
and you are arguing that, you know, oh, everything is colorblind and race doesn't matter. But then and, you lose. And, and then reality <laughs> hits, and you're in a country with 400 years of racial history that matters. That's problematic. Like, she can't, you so can't play I, the dance. So th th and so now she's out here. I mean, I mean oh my God. I'm, I'm shackled. I'm, 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 here's, here's the deal. This is very simple, okay? Me and love. You should come on here. We can have a conversation. We can have a discussion of all these issues. For four years, four years we've been trying to get Mia Love to come on the show. For four years, y'all, that's been happening for four years. And let me also help y'all. Y'all think I'm lying. As a matter of fact, somebody from New York has called me. Hey, I got to call you back. Okay, so let me pull this up. I, I just want y'all to understand. Okay, I'm going to pull this up right now. I'm not going to put, I'm not going to show a number. <laughs> September 23rd, 2017. I sent her a text, no response. November 20th, 2017, I sent her a text, no response. Uh, November 13th, I sent her a text, no response. Now, I hope she gave me the right number. She gave you the right number. But guess number. what? <laughs> I handed her my phone. But she... No, 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 no. I handed her my phone. Ask yourself this she question. She typed the number in. She, what interview has she ever done? I'm just saying. What interview has you I, ever I seen more, her do? I'm willing to have a conversation with her. <laughs> she's not going to have that conversation. Come because that she's conversation just is in at the and heart I've seen of the problem done, done, done a couple of being a black Republican. I, here's the deal. Since she's unshackled, <laughs> since she's unhinged, she can now talk black. You are more than welcome to come on the only daily digital show that talks to black people. She played the game the way he wanted her to play it, and she still lost. So that means you should do things differently and say, let me buck the system. Maybe it'll work. Maybe right. she should have won. Who there knows? you go. And he embarrassed her when he could have actually back. said, she could have said something this entire time. There I mean, go. there was Stop. nothing stopping her. All right, <laughs> y'all. You know All right, time for our HBCU hashtag, HBCU Giving Day School. <laughs> it ain't hard to figure out. I'm wearing a damn sweatshirt. Uh, go ahead and roll it. Y'all, so every Monday, of course, I wear HBCU gear. Uh, universities have actually uh, spoken to or visited. And so today is Lincoln University, Chester County, Pennsylvania, founded in 1854. The first degree granting HBCU in the country. Notable graduates, Thurgood Marshall, Langston Hughes, Cap Calloway, uh, Frederick D. Alexander, Roscoe Lee Brown, Melvin Tolson, but also, uh, also Kwame Nkrumah, many African leaders when they came to the United States, were actually uh, attendees at Lincoln University before they went back uh, to Africa. And so to support Lincoln, go to www.lincoln.edu, lincoln.edu. And so I spoke there last year for the president uh, when she uh, had her uh, swearing in. So that's why, that's why I got the sweaters of Lincoln. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, y'all. Did y'all see this video? Roll it. Now, we thought we had seen everything. When the sky is cracked. And Jesus Christ comes again, and every eye will see him when he comes again. So here's our question for you this morning, brothers and sisters. The simple question is this right here. Are you ready? Are you ready for his return? Amen. <laughs> All right, amen. Sisters, are you ready today for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he's on his way back. That is what James was dealing with there. And I appreciate... All right, y'all. That was Reverend Bartholomew Orr, senior pastor, Brown Missionary Baptist Church in South Haven, Mississippi. That video went viral when a woman, uh, she, was, she is the daughter of a member. Uh, she actually uh, shot that video and posted it. Man, it has gotten millions of views. Folks have been angry, upset, blasting him, blasting the church, blasting the entire black church. I was sitting here going back and forth with people yesterday uh, on this whole video, uh, and they were saying the church, they don't do a damn thing for the poor. They don't help people in their community. And I'm going, y'all don't even go there. And so then I get a phone call from my, one, of my, one of my colleagues uh, sent me a text and saying, hey, I had a friend of his who was a publicist who, rep who said there's a client who want to speak to me. I said, okay, fine. Just have him send me an email. Well, it happened to be the publicist of Pastor Orr. And so I got the email, and she said he, he said he's been getting interview requests from everybody, but he only wanted to talk to me. And so now he's here. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered. Pastor Orr, welcome to the show. Uh, hey, how are you doing, Roland? Uh, glad to have you. All right, so let's, let's start first off, okay? Um, 
uh, it's so many stuff I got to deal with. Okay, so uh, the the uh, the apparatus itself, people like you wasted money. You didn't ask right. the members for permission. Uh, <laughs> that was a, a complete waste of tithes. Can you explain yeah. the apparatus and why it was there at the church? Uh, every year we do this Christmas, soulful Christmas production. It's a singing Christmas tree with drama attached to it. We've been doing it now for about 10 years. The last four of those years, we have had this flying apparatus in uh, to where we fly in angels, fly in uh, Gabriel. Uh, we flew in some drummers one year when we were talking about uh, drumming. And so this has been something that's been used in our church for the last few years. And it just so happened that last week I was up there when they were going through their flying school. And I said, hey, I've never tried this. Let me let me try it. Tried it, made a video, uh, just a comical video, because we're celebrating 136 years anniversary. Wanted to get people involved with Vision 2025. And so I said, y'all come to church, see the flying preacher this coming Sunday. But that's the flying joke, but support Vision 2025. Okay, so so so, so you sent out a notice to your members. Yeah. Come see the flying preacher. And you and you <laughs> and you incorporated uh this apparatus and you coming in in your sermon. Yes. What was, the, so na the, what was the name of the sermon? The the name of the sermon, Are You Ready for His Return? I'm preaching through the book of James. And so the apparatus was already in place, no dollars, uh, tithe money or church money, because our Soul for Christmas is sponsored uh, by different individuals and corporations that sponsor. This is a free event that we put on for the public. Okay, so Pastor, so what do you make of all these folks just attacking you? I, I, I've seen it. This is unnecessary. Uh, I'm paying more attention to him flying in than the word. Then, now, first of all, you can actually see the whole sermon on YouTube. You had right. somebody who read the scripture. You, when you came in, this was the beginning of your sermon. And for the rest of the sermon until the end, you, you had the apparatus that you were still strapped in, but you were behind the pulpit for about 50 right. minutes. Well, hopefully not that long. I, I know I'm a Baptist preacher. I try not to be too long. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, uh, the message was going forth. Uh, one of the things that we've been promoting is digital discipleship. How can we use social media in order to get the word of Jesus Christ out? As a pastor, I've seen so many people as it relates to being unprepared, not ready, not only for the Lord's return, but even for unexpected death and sudden tragedies that happen. And so I'm preaching through the book of James, great opportunity to grab folks' attention to let's say, hey, are you truly ready for his return? And, and by the way, Roland, I'm an object preacher. I've been pastoring this church for 30 years come January. They have seen everything, you name it, they have seen it. So I, when you say that, I saw one video, you were dressed like a cop. Uh, yes, dressed like a cop. This year, I preached on a ladder. Uh, it was stepping up uh, your faith, step up in faith. And so I climbed the ladder all the way up to the very top and closed my sermon at the very top. Um, my goodness, a couple of months ago, I even had on some wigs. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so, so again, so for people who go to your church, this is not unfamiliar to them. Right. Now, right. So, so, but how do you deal with this reaction, though, from all the Christians, and I say the heathens, uh, and the people who love attacking a black church, uh, who start assuming all kind of stuff, attacking you, attacking your ministry, saying y'all do nothing for the poor, y'all stealing money, he probably drive a Ferrari or a Bentley. I mean, it was all this sort of stuff all on social media. Well, first of all, let me just say this. Um, we, we love and respect everybody and, and their views and so forth. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 that if the gospel is being further, uh, even if we have to take a tax, that's fine with us for the furtherance of the gospel. And the gospel has definitely uh, been further. Eight million folks have at least heard the question, heard the statement, Jesus is returning. Are you ready for his return? And, and so my people, uh, also the church brown, um, this church have grown over, it's 136 years. I've been there 30 years. 
Um, the Lord had blessed us to grow from 66 to over 11,000. The church is known for the good that it does in the community as we um, share the gospel of Jesus Christ, but more importantly, as we spread even good deeds in the community. We tithe back into the community um, our missions, dollars, and benevolence, over 10% of everything that comes into the church. So when you hear, again, your critics who said this was a waste, you you took the focus off the word, it should be on Jesus. Also, they said you should be preaching about Jesus in love. I mean, when you hear those criticisms solely based upon seeing the video, no context, no nuance, no nothing, then what do you say? Well, somebody is going to go watch the whole video. Somebody wants to see it for themselves. And in that message, I deal with things like work while we wait. I deal with we ought to love um, as we live. I, I deal with even uh, how we ought to endure suffering and talk about the divisiveness and even how we ought to use our words uh, to be helpful and wholesome. So if they listen to the message, and like I said, I've been preaching the whole uh, through the whole book of James, this is all about everyday faith. How do we take our faith outside and beyond the walls of church? And so I'm just excited and glad that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going forth. Uh, just a couple more questions for you. Um, again, I, I, I was really going off on one particular person because they were really pissing me off. I'm just being straight up. I ain't got no problem saying that. God knows I'm going to cuss folks out. Now, look, my wife is ordained minister. She's been ordained uh, going on 30 years. I have been in numerous churches, small, mid-sized, and large. I have seen preachers, men and women, use props and things along those lines. What really angered me the most was folks who saw this video, see, right there, that's what's wrong with the black church. The black church not doing, I said, well, stop. Y'all saw one video, and then just all of a sudden, every black church in America ain't nothing. Every black church in America not helping the poor. Every black church in America is still in ties. And I said, finally, I said, you know what? A bunch of y'all, you're going to find any excuse to deal with any church because you don't want to deal with your own issues when it comes to the church that you actually went to. Yes. Well, and here's the good thing. Brown is doing all of those things. So we're in the community. We're feeding the, uh, we're feeding the hungry. We're clothing the naked. Uh, we are sheltering the homeless. We're being there for those that are called in disaster. We are doing things locally, nationally as well as international. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is going forth. Good deeds are going forth in the name of Christ. And if we need to use props, even as Jesus himself used, in order to grab folks' attention and get them to start thinking about their eternity, I believe it's all a good thing. Uh, I got to ask you this here. You're in Mississippi. Uh, What are y'all doing to get the vote out uh, for Mike Espy? If they go to our website, uh, every, we have a political action ministry. And so I am not one uh, to endorse candidates, uh, but I do very much have an open door policy to where we have a political action ministry that actually bring candidates in, forums in. Uh, Mike Espy actually visited and worshiped with us. We have been pushing uh, voter registration as well as voter turnout. Uh, there is a video on our website of, of Miss Olivia Leggett, one of our members, who was the first African American woman uh, mayor in her particular town. She won that seat uh, back in '77, defeating a white man by 10 votes. Well, she went on to be elected and serve in that position for the over 20 for 20 years. And, um, and so she is encouraging people that every vote count. And we have been constantly pushing that message. Um, and again, we've been open to our members, uh, informing them that it's coming forth, coming up, and for everyone to go out. Uh, I'll, I'll play this here. Y'all go ahead here and take, take my iPad, please. Stay fixed up 
so that you can be free. Now, Pastor, I got to ask, while you were suspended in air, you were sitting there punching your hand. Uh, at what point were you thinking, man, I sure hope this thing is sturdy. <laughs> I'm moving a lot. Hey, I I'm glad Justin them had hooked me in uh, securely. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was a fun opportunity to be able to, one of the uh, joys of pastoring, and I appreciate Brown, and, and uh, it's such a loving, supportive church, uh, down through the years, seeing the vision, uh, following along with the vision, seeing how God have used us to really advance the kingdom of God. So uh, I appreciate them praying with me <laughs> while I was up there in the air. All right, then. Well, so again, so for all the folks who've been sitting there talking about the flying preacher, I passed, I even had one woman say, well, are members, are they allowed to use the apparatus? I was like, y'all, y'all lost. I see. I said, y'all gonna really make me cuss y'all out on Twitter. Uh, so Pastor Orr, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you for explaining. If, if they, Go ahead. If, if they want to see the apparatus in use December the 5th and the 7th, they can come. I think we're flying in. We might even fly in Jesus uh, in the apparatus. Well, have, no, are, are, are you selling tickets or is it free? <clears throat> it's free, open to the public. And okay. that's, that's what I'm saying. Everything is free because we've had great sponsors gotcha. who sponsor the uh, and for, Social for Christmas. And for the rest of y'all who are confused, y'all can, can go to Brown Missionary <laughs> Baptist Church YouTube channel to actually that's see it. the full sermon. It's right, right. there, Brown Missionary Baptist Church. Go to their YouTube channel. You can see the full sermon, and y'all can stop making stuff up about what y'all heard and what they didn't do and all that sort of nonsense. Uh, and so, uh, and Pastor Orr, we surely appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And Roland, thank you. All right. Have a good one. Uh, re re real quick, I, I just, I, I just got to get a quick uh, uh, comment from my <laughs> panel. Mike, go ahead. Look, <clears throat> all I know is that nothing against my church. I'm a proud member of 19th Street Baptist. Um, I can never imagine my pastor doing what he did, but more power to the pastor. Lauren? I thought it was cute. <laughs> I thought it was a cute thing. I mean, you know, to get people to, to spike interest in the church, although the, the church seemed full, you know, which that was oh, full no, probably because of him. <laughs> so I thought it was cute. Eugene? Mm -hmm. Next level preaching is needed for a next level uh, <laughs> generation. Again, so for, but look, so let me go ahead and say this here. And so uh, let me just break this thing down. Uh, to all y'all church haters out there, to all you church haters, let me just cut to the chase. Y'all always looking for an excuse to slam the black church, okay? I've heard all of the excuses. I've heard all the people say, this is why young folks not going. This is right. why people are not interested in the church. If you heard the video, the whole audience was cracking up laughing. They know they pastor. They know how he preaches. They know how he rolls. But see, the real, they, all the people talk about, oh, that's taken away from the word. No, let's just stop it. You know, doggone well, they all y'all not so holy. Because see, I recall a time where gospel people actually said the whinings. That's wrong. We, we can't have that kind of talk. We can't have that. We can't even have, see, a bunch of y'all go to churches right now where they got saxophones and trumpets and drum sets and they got a whole musical section. I remember the day people said, oh, no, that's going against God having all that stuff in church. You always have these purists, but you really got haters. You got people who always want to hate on preachers, who want to hate on church. And the reality is there's a whole bunch of churches who are doing some good. There's some foul people in church. You know why? There's some foul people outside of church because crazy folk outside of church actually belong to church. Now, if you got a problem with this pastor flying in, that's your problem. You know why? You don't go to his church. You don't tithe. You don't put, put any offering. You ain't doing nothing to pay for their lights, to pay for their pews, pay for anything. And so I say, shut the hell up. Oh, I know. <laughs> We're talking about church. And y'all probably <laughs> mad that I'm cussing, but I don't really care because it, it grates on me when I see people who constantly condemn the black church when... If you really want to ask the question, the level of scholarships being given, the people who are helping folks in need, show me another institution in the black community that's doing more. I'll wait. <laughs> See, that's the problem. And so when you somehow uh, ascribe one thing, that's what's totally wrong with the church, then you the problem. So guess what? If you don't go to church, that's your deal. Fine. That means that if you say there's something wrong with every single church in America, that's fine. Go to a white church, a Latino church, 
Go to a Catholic, a Baptist, Episcopalian. You know what? Don't even go. But I'm really sick and tired of people blaming the entire black church for every single thing wrong in a black community. Shut it. Because the reality is the black church has done a heck of a whole lot to save black folks and will always be there. And you know what I also know? A bunch of y'all who hate the black church, when your ass gets sick, or when your kids get sick, and when somebody needs some help, guess what y'all do? Y'all go find that holy roller at work and say, can you pray with me? <laughs> See, you spend your time dogging the church, but you're quick to find somebody who go to church when you in need. That's all I got to say. Amen. All right, y'all, update on some racist white folks who lost their damn mind. <clears throat> now, y'all know we deal with crazy-ass white women and crazy-ass white men. Remember the white woman in Maryland who called a black man the N-word because she didn't like the way he drove out of his parking spot? And his wife, Don Tosin Hightower, got out of the car to confront her with a camera rolling. Well, we now discover that the woman is a teacher in Prince George's County. And the Prince George's County investigated and released a statement saying they were disappointed and disturbed, but could not fire her because she was a union employee. Well, that teacher decided to retire, which will take effect on December 1st. She will retire with her full benefits. So all y'all black teachers, there's an opening in Prince George's County. And speaking of opening... That's one also with the Hilton uh, Resort Unit. You know why? White boy this weekend, y'all, actually posted on social media that he wanted to lynch Willie Taggart, the Florida State football coach, because he lost to Florida on Saturday and they finished 5-7 and seven and didn't go to a bowl, bowl game. Yeah, straight up, y'all. Now, pull the video put, photo back up. Then he posted on there, no, 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 I'm serious. I'll do it. His name is Tom Shand. Well, y'all, Hilton Grand Vacations today fired poor Tom as a result uh, of his stupid post. So, black people, if y'all want to work for Hilton Grand Vacations, I suggest y'all get him a call because there's been at least one opening at Hilton Grand Vacations in Florida because Tom was stupid. Now he done lost his job. All right, y'all. want to thank Michael, Lauren, and Eugene. Tomorrow we're going to deal with uh, the races in North Carolina, Republican Party. That's right. They back, back at it. They call a special session to try to pass a voter ID bill. Y'all, they, they, they are worse than Mississippi and Alabama uh, doing Jim Crow. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow uh, show as well. Uh, and again, Mia Love, holla at a brother. I'm here. And Eugene, uh, holla at I'm here. Eugene also sent me this here, uh, this real quick. Apparently, uh, Paul Manafort uh, lied to the FBI and the special counsel nice. and is now in breach of his plea agreement. Right. Let's see how quick did he hits that jail cell. Is that going to do the sentence? All I'm saying <laughs> is, all I'm saying is, don't bend down, Paul. All right, y'all, you want to support Roller Martin on the Filter, go to RollerMartinOnTheFilter.com. Join our Brina Funk fan club. We certainly would appreciate it. Your donations makes this possible. And so, again, we want you to join the fan club right now. Nobody else is bringing you these kind of stores, these kind of guests. This is how we do it. And so we look forward to having you uh, support us. Go to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. All right, y'all. I got to go. I will see y'all tomorrow. Mississippi, boom!